Hello and welcome once again to The Freel Thing with me, Greg Freel. That was a vaguely professional introduction, um, which is very good because my guest today is none other, none, 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 none other than Mel Sherwood. I'm, I'm keeping that in. I'm not, I'm not cutting that. Clearly you did your tongue twisters beforehand. Exactly, exactly. Uh, the legend that is Mel Sherwood, Mel who are you and why am I talking to you? Well, I am Mel Sherwood and I am a pitch and presentation specialist and founder of The Red Effect. And that really means is uh, that I work with entrepreneurs and business professionals who want to communicate with more confidence, credibility and charisma. Why are you talking to me? Hopefully I can help people with those things. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, as you do every day. Um, and, you know, as we do on this podcast, we're just quietly saving lives here, Mel. I think that's just the way we want to think about Important it. Important work that we do. Indeed. Indeed. Um, now, I met you, I'm trying to think when I met you, um, sometime August, September, maybe? Probably. Last yes. year? Yeah. Um, and I believe I said something insulting, thinking I was being funny about your hair, which you didn't get. And you were just like, wow, he's the most obnoxious man <laughs> I've ever met, uh, which basically meant I was playing catch up for a few weeks whenever I was talking to you then about helping you with a song that you wanted to write and I'm like no 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 no, honest I'm good I'm not that annoying <laughs> all the time don't know that I've finally convinced you of that but um we did we did record that song we did yeah. um which um have you, you you haven't done anything with that yet have you it's not not really <laughs> made, made pop, right okay <clears throat> but um it'll be going on a compilation album of spectacular songs coming out soon no doubt um but yeah so then you know we got chatting about the red effect and and, and how that um program works and and yeah and that, that's kind of really how we got involved on the next thing that we were doing which was how would we describe it well it's, it's become this kind of motivational kind of film i suppose this video um, but the way it started for you was a poem. You you were, you were in the studio recording the song, and you said, "I've got this poem. Um, what do you think?" Um, and I started by saying, first of all, it's not terrible," which I think was fairly encouraging for me. <laughs> and I, I, I'm glad I'll, that I'm kind of understanding the way you operate now. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> not easily offended when you say things. But because if you didn't, you'd be like, "Who is this obnoxious man, and why am I spending time with him?" Um, but the thing is, I was I was like, oh, this sounds like the like the script effectively to a, a motivational video, uh, and you know, and then that's what we ended up doing, um, and I think it's awesome. Is it just me? It's not just me, is it? I don't know. I it's had some great feedback, so that's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, it but was, you it hate it. Just... Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, right. So tell us a little bit about the red effect. Now, I mean, I know all about it, obviously. Um, but um, for the folks at home, what the hell is the red effect? Sure. So the red effect is about being more red and being more red is about getting back to who you are and what you care about and being able to really boldly and unapologetically express yourself. And it stemmed from a situation that came about for me when I has, was feeling completely out of flow, like I completely lost my mojo. And I was feeling pretty miserable. And I don't know what happens to you when you're kind of out of flow or a bit uh, out of sorts, a bit stuck. But for me, there are three things that happen. One of them is that I spend way too much time on social media. So I'm kind of observing other people's lives and avoiding my own, which I'm sure uh, <laughs> there's a few people can I think we're all guilty that. of that. Uh, the second thing is that I eat my body weight in junk food. And the third thing is that I stop wearing my red lipstick and I know that sounds oh. a bit trivial and frivolous, but actually... No, I understand. <laughs> I, know, I understand that completely. It might be about... I think probably the equivalent for you would be that you don't do your hair. Exactly. I was just going to say. Yeah. I mean, it's it's totally... It's it's that image thing. That's, you know, it's your identity. What is it that you feel kind of defines you? So, like, if I was having a bad hair day, then, you know, that would be... I'd be feeling the same way. Yeah. So what happens is I just, you know, I was feeling really miserable and 
I just couldn't seem to shake it, despite the fact everything in my life was going pretty well. My business was going well. I just bought and renovated a new place to live and I bought a cute little red convertible car, but I wasn't excited about anything. Didn't even want to drive my mm. new car. And I had a conversation with a friend of mine and we spoke for about two hours. And at the end of the conversation, he said, Mel, I think the answer is really simple. He said, everyone associates the color red with you. It's vibrant and energetic and positive. So really, you just need to get back to the Mel that we all know and love. You need to put on your red lipstick and go for a drive in your red car. Just stop being blue and be more red. And obviously, you know, if I, if he really thought that I was super depressed or whatever, he would never just say stop being blue. Sure. Yeah. But it was the perfect thing for me to hear. And at the end of the conversation, the three words, be more red, were just ringing in my ears. And I got off the phone and I kept thinking about it. And I thought, what does actually be more red mean? And as I said, it's kind of about getting back to the core of who I am, what I really care about, what's important to me. Um, and then I started to think, well, being more red is, is quite cool, but actually red means something different to everyone. And we're kind of different shades of red in different situations. So I started to think about red as an acronym. And as soon as I hit on that, and like within 24 hours, I I'd, I'd bought the domain name, bemorered.com. I'd started writing a book. And I'd started to think about this idea of red as an acronym and thinking about, well, actually, what do I need to be? What, what kind of words do I need to connect with in order to show up in a different way? And then, uh, so for example, last year I had uh, a shade of red as my overall arching kind of shade of red for the year. And it was about being real, expressed and daring. So mm -hmm. that was about me being really true to myself and real. And a lot of changes happened last year that uh, helped me reconnect with who I was. Uh, expressed, making sure that I, I was fully expressed, didn't leave things unsaid. And as we've just talked about, I wrote a song and I also wrote that, that spoken word piece. So that was kind of me getting back to the creative part of me. And then daring yeah. is actually doing it and putting it out there because I, I you know I have a singing and I have a, have a bit of a challenging history mm -hmm. and so it was really daring for me to actually uh, record that song and even to share it with anyone and and to share that poem and so and just to start getting out there more again and so as part of that I had worked on the program uh, the red effect a, a few years prior and it was kind of playing around in the background. And then last year I really brought it to life and I created an online program for women specifically um, mm -hmm. for this particular one. And it, it's, I've run it twice now, it's running again uh, in April and it, it's getting fabulous feedback. So I'm really excited to be able to share, mm -hmm. you know, what I love and what's really helped me with other women so that they can be more read as well. Do you find that, I mean, Obviously, I, I, I'm familiar with your program, but do you find that people are looking for, I mean, part of the process is initially analyzing who they are and, and where they are. So maybe red, the, the red and your acronym there is kind of, this is just going to reflect who I am just now. And then do you then take them on a journey to um, project where they want to be? Is, is there you know a different stage in it, you know, that, okay, this is who you are just now. But this is who you want to be yeah and that's, that's yeah and sort of and it, it's a whole nother red acronym so it's reflect then explore and then decide so reflect on on who you are what your past is where you're at at what you, in your life what's working what's not working uh, mm. explore some of the ways and things that you would like to be and experience and then make a decision and in as part of that thinking about what action you're going to take to make changes and also thinking about the obstacles, things that might stop you making those changes and being prepared for that and addressing it and making sure you've got options and uh, strategies to make sure that you can actually achieve that. So let's hop back um, a few a few years um, to the Mel Red Effect origin story. Um, this is like the superhero origin story here. Um, I mean, obviously, this was born out, like you, know, like you said, you were in this sort of flat sort of period. But before that, you know, you actually had a life as a performer, you were you know, a singer and, and on stage. Um, and that was a huge part of your life. How much did that inform your decision to then go into pitch and presentation skills and teaching people about that side of things? Yeah. OK, so. Yeah, I did start life as a performer and I, I worked as an actor and a singer and did a bit of presenting and that sort of thing. 
And then, but at the same time, I worked in business and learned a whole lot of skills in business as well. And then I fell into learning and development, which I loved. And that took me into the world of training and coaching and that sort of thing. And, and one of the first courses that I was asked to design and deliver was a presentation skills course. So I went off to an organization called Toastmasters and I thought I better learn how to do this. And so I kind of went through that process and was fortunate to win some public speaking competitions and that sort of thing, which the whole process of that just built my skills and gave me so much more knowledge as I went through. And so that was kind of in the background. And I'd always thought that at some stage I wanted my own business. And so uh, an ex and, and I came up with an idea of an online platform for the performing arts industry. I left my job with the idea of, of bringing that to life and making that my business and building it so that um, eventually he could leave his job and come and come and join me to do mm -hmm. that. And so it took a risk, really, because I just stopped, uh, you know, on a Friday, I, I finished my 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 day job, my safe, secure, well-paid job in learning and development. And then on a Monday, I started in a startup accelerator uh, that was going to help me kind of build this business. And they, they weren't that keen on the idea. They didn't think it was really feasible, but they gave me a place on the program and said, prove to us it's a good idea. And it was only then that I decided to start doing some research about whether this was going to be a feasible business mm -hmm. idea. And turns out that whilst everybody loved the idea, it, no one was prepared to pay for it so it was never going to make any money and right. so but what I realized in the process of that is that I was really good at pitching the idea so I was able to get people enthusiastic and inspired about the idea I was able to reduce it and condense it all into a very easy to understand and compelling one minute pitch and so then people started asking me for help uh, with their pitches and I got more and more opportunities as a result of being able to, to pitch effectively. And so within a few weeks, I've kind of, you know, we talk about in business, the idea of pivoting. I'd done a complete pirouette and kind of went, OK, let's let's park the idea for this online platform uh, for the performing arts industry. And let's draw on my training and uh, coaching background, as well as my performance skills and I was able to support people uh, going forward and, you know, delivering training and coaching, specializing in pitching and presentation skills. Do you find that obviously both of us have that background in performance? I think it really does give you that almost it's, you know, this instinctive edge when it comes to presentations or doing webinars, workshops and that set of things. I think there's an awful lot of stuff that becomes second nature. If you're used to being on stage and used to performing, all you're doing is really just slightly changing the dialogue uh, and the script is slightly different. And obviously, you know, what what's right for the room in terms of tone. Um, but certainly I've found that having those years of experience in front of people being not entirely pleasant and people being super pleasant and, you know, everything in between, it kind of really does prepare you for every conceivable situation, don't you think? I think so. I'm really grateful, I, I think, for that grounding. I mean, I've been on stage since I was, well, six and, and even before that in the kindergarten nativity play. But actually, I, I started performing regularly when I was around six. And that the discipline of just understanding stagecraft and understanding how to uh, be in that environment and understanding how to connect with the part of you that needs to be on when you're in front of that audience. Uh, all of that's really, really helped. And I think, yeah, it does become second nature and you learn tools to manage nerves and, you know, to, to, to be able to tap into that performance element. Uh, what's interesting for me is that I think, you know, I, I studied, acting and I, I had wanted to I, singing was always going to be part of it and then something someone said to me when I was eight kind of really made me paranoid about my voice and I didn't actually sing solo in public till I was in my 20s uh, but interestingly enough that whole um you know the, the 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 performance element it that was always me playing a character and even when mm -hmm. I eventually started singing, I was I was doing musical theatre and then I was sung in a 60s girl band tribute show and I was still playing a character. And so one of the biggest challenges for me with singing was to actually sing as myself. And so, you know, now I sing in a band and it's it's actually me, me performing as me singing those songs. But it took 
Uh, and then the, the same thing when I first started doing public speaking, it was a real challenge for me not to have a script and to actually just be mm-hmm. naturally myself in front of an audience. That, that was a real learning curve for me. And I remember the first speech that I ever did when I went to Toastmasters and the, the guy who was evaluating it said, that was fantastic. That was the best icebreaker speech I've ever seen. It, it wasn't because I know what I did. I wrote a script and I learned the script. And because of my acting background, I was able to deliver that naturally. Yeah. But it was still a performance and there was a disconnect between that the truth. And as an actor, you, you have to tap into that truth and you've got to connect with those feelings, but it's still a performance. And so there, it's a, been a really interesting journey for me to work out the balance between actually just showing up as, as myself and being that natural kind of authentic version of me but also having the performance element that's required to engage an audience and and be compelling to listen to so it's been a really interesting journey and it it was quite a surprise for me that it was more difficult than I expected actually Mm -hmm. I mean I think that's the thing for me is that um realizing that whenever I'm doing a lot of business content in terms of workshops or webinars or seminars uh, in the real world um certainly initially i was like how do i need to do this do, you know am i it, it, am i being me uh, which is ott and attention seeking and, <laughs> and i'll try and keep it humorous if it's appropriate <laughs> um, uh, but I certainly wasn't that guy whenever I started doing the, the business side of things because I felt like mm, I think I should, maybe I should dial it back a bit. And now I don't um, because at the end of the day, you know, you just need to authentic, authentically be yourself um, as and it's something that you you preach um, all the time, you know, through the whole Red Effect program. And but I think it, it can take a while to kind of be comfortable in that space in terms of just knowing that no, it's actually it's OK to just be that person because the people that get you will get you and the people that think you're obnoxious will just avoid you Um, (laughs) and that's fine and kind of works out quite well. I think what's interesting is we we often we well certainly I know it's true for a lot of a lot of women in particular but um, a lot of people generally is that whole people pleasing thing and it comes Mm. up in the program the red effect when when I'm working with uh, the women is that you know, we spend so much of our lives trying to be who we think we should be and do what we think we should do and and please the people around us that we completely lose touch with who we are and what we really care about and how we want to really express ourselves. And so I think there's this, this, uh, yeah, balance to be struck again, where you do just allow yourself to be uh, naturally you, but also developing the confidence enough to know that it's okay to be you and not everyone has to like it. And to be honest, yeah. it's still a challenge for me. I want, I like to be liked. We all like to be liked. <laughs> yeah, I'm, totally. I mean, I, I mean, at the core of me is I'm an entertainer and I want to entertain people. So being an entertainer means you want people to like you, you know, um, and you know, think you're funny or, or whatever it is. Um, but, but still, I think it's getting it to that stage where when you're being authentic, you're doing that, but on your own terms, you know, for, for me, there's certain things I'm like, no, I don't want to do that anymore, but I want to do that. Um, and I think it's just recognizing exactly what that is. And I think that's what your program does is it helps you fine tune exactly what that is. So you kind of get down to the core of no, no, that's who I am. Those are, those those are the specific things that actually define me. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's not necessarily an easy journey. And a a lot of people who come on my program, they've never done any real personal development work before. So it can Mm -hmm. be a bit confronting to start to think about these these questions. I've been a personal development junkie, I suppose, since I was, you know, my late teens, early 20s. I've always been fascinated by, you know, how how we work and how we think and how we how we can improve ourselves and, and I, I, I'm always looking to understand myself better so that I understand better how I re- interact with the world. But there are people who haven't done any of that. And so that can sometimes be yeah, a bit confronting and a bit uh, uncomfortable. But what I love is being able to create this really safe space 
for people who can just actually start to share and start to really think, oh, yeah, actually, what is it that's working in my life? What's not? Who am I? What do I really care about? Why am I doing these things that actually frustrate me or annoy me or, or whatever? And sometimes we are so lost that we don't even know what we like anymore or, or who we are. So, yeah, the, the, the program really helps people get back in, in touch with that and build the confidence to stand in their own power, really. And I, I love using the word empowered because it has R-E-D at the end. Empowered. Of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so... One of the things that, you know, obviously that always comes up in these conversations um, presently with, with people is how things have changed for your business over the past year. Um, I know that you took some time off initially whenever um, the whole lockdown thing was announced because you've just kind of been on the treadmill effectively, just working, working, working. Uh, but then when you got back to it, um, what did what did that look like initially whenever you first started working again? Well, uh, everything, yeah, everything was was cancelled or postponed in March last year, and there was an option for me to get online and and transfer everything online and adapt and and whatever. But as you said, I I did take a break, and I'd been getting nudges from the universe for, to take a break for quite a while. I was pretty burnt out, and around that time, there was a lot of energy and and hustle online and people saying you know do my thing or buy my program or here's a free webinar mm -hmm. and adapt 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 resilience da, 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 da. and I just got overwhelmed and I thought you know what if there's ever a good time for me to take a step back uh, from my business when no one's actually going to notice is <laughs> right now so yeah. I decided to do that and and that was me being more red that was me finally being really really true to myself and that's part of the daring part is actually daring to step away and not not yeah. really uh, work for several months. And I was fortunate that I, I had some savings, so I was able to do that and, you know, not, not feel desperately uncomfortable or scared that I couldn't make the mortgage payment or anything. So I, I allowed myself to do that. And that then gave me the energy to, to well, I, I was, you know, refreshed, re-energized to, to come back. And so work start, did start coming back and my regular clients who I might, you know, maybe do a program once a year for them or whatever, mm -hmm. came back and said, we still want to run this program. Let's do it online. So work started to slowly come in. Um, and then uh, I, I worked on the Red Effect program and brought that to life, which was great. So it's really interesting that, as I said before, I wanted, I have, when I left my, my job, eight years ago, I wanted an online business. I, I you know, had an idea for an online platform for the performing arts industry because I really value freedom and flexibility of time and location, which online off offers us. So sure, for yeah. me, it was a real gift and a real reminder to get back to what I wanted originally. So I have have shifted and changed and, and I'm still adapting as we all are in, in this uh, environment. But I've, I've, I've done... Uh, two training sessions in person back in November and December last year when the, the lockdown was lifted a little bit. And that mm -hmm. was very weird because the organization that I went and worked with, they they hadn't changed much. They were um, a manufacturer, so they, they were keeping on. So they had all their, um, some of their staff furloughed, but most of them were still there. And it was really interesting to be in an environment with people again because I live alone, I work alone. Yeah. Uh, it's been a very, from that point of view, it's been uh, a big change as well and just not being in the company of people in real life has been a, a really interesting change and here i am mm. thinking, you know i wanted an online business now i've got it and suddenly like oh my goodness i don't know i think i need people as well <laughs> so yeah. yeah i mean I, th I think that's the thing is that i i, I certainly I, you know, i'm a people person and i love to have an audience um but um i think the thing that i've really appreciated though is slowing down because my life has always just been frantic and, um, you know, lots of travel every day and, you know, just and crazy hours. And so the thing that has worked for me has been able to just do this um, and not be running around frantic, still doing, you know, busy hours, but more, you know, just just at a steady pace and not feeling quite so wrung out mm. um, working, working crazy hours. Yeah. The challenge, um, I suppose, is that we 
really are living at work now when we're yes. at home we're here you know so there's it's deciding it, no it, i'm actually going to stop yeah it mm. is a real challenge to escape it and to you know especially when you work for yourself and, and a lot of people who are listening probably have their own businesses and yeah it is it is really hard to get those boundaries and to make sure that you uh, don't allow work to kind of creep into every moment of every day uh, because you know as a business owner you you it's on your mind all the time it is really hard to switch off yeah. but actually when you are in that situation that oh well I might as well just do a bit of work but then it's it takes over your life and uh, you know I'm, I'm grateful I moved moved house last year as well as part of being more red you know and re- reconnecting with who I am I, it's really important to for me to live by the beach. So I moved to the beach last year and having that has been, you know, an absolute godsend really for, I'm so grateful to have that environment to escape to, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I have to really force myself when I'm stuck in, in work mode and I, I just want to keep going and there's always something to do. I really have to yeah. force myself. To take I think it's the guilt now. that comes with being self-employed. It's like, Oh, I should be doing mm, something. Yeah. There's, always, there's always something that you should be doing. What would you say is, you know, if you could could give one piece of advice for people who are, you know, they're on their Zoom calls all the time, night and day at the moment, what's the one thing more than anything else that people get wrong? In terms of how they come across or how, how they, how they you know, present, you know, pre- presenting themselves and, you know, the, the thing that you you would acknowledge straight away and go, that's incredibly annoying. You know, I, you know yeah. you need, so, the, so the you biggest thing that. that I see that I notice that can impact whether how how well people are engaged is actually looking at yourself. So as soon as I start to look yep. at myself or I look at other someone else on the screen, I've lost connection with you, yeah. But as soon mm-hmm. as I then look back into the camera, it feels connected again. And so if if you know if you think about changing one thing, it's learning how to look into the camera lens. And actually, there's a difference between looking at the camera and looking through the camera. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that people once they finally get used to looking at the camera, they just look at the camera and speak to the camera like that. But actually, if you think about looking through the camera, and uh, imagine that your favourite person is the other side of the camera lens, Absolutely, can sometimes yeah. help you know bring that warmth and friendliness that we need in order to come across well on video. Yeah. So going forward, uh, you have the red effect coming up again soon. When's that happening? April 22nd, there's a waiting list at the moment. So if anyone's interested, they will just need to- They're just gonna have to wait. Sign up, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's, uh, there is a waiting list at, at bemoread.com. That was my next question. I was like, how can <laughs> they find out about it? <laughs> Mel, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. And I know you further. I know you will. <laughs> it's what I do. I know. Thanks a lot. Thanks.